Hi, Chris. Hello, Richard. <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. Yes. Meeting made possible only with new technology, hmm? Exactly. Me, me in North Carolina and the USA, our, our guests from all over the world, I see. Yep, absolutely. And, uh, and also the magic of, you know, even though we're doing this now, um, many other people will be watching this in another now. Yeah. And I want to welcome all the, all of those people in all of those nows. Yeah. yeah. All those different timelines. Yes. It sure has been fun having this dialogue with you, sharing ideas and perspectives on reincarnation. I've really been enjoying it. Me too. Me too. I, I it's, I've learned a lot from you and, uh, and, you know, since I read your book, um, it really, you know, a book that really blew, blew my mind um, and had so many resonances for me, diamonds uh, and, um, you know, LSD and the mind of the universe. Those who haven't heard about that yet, it's quite something, um, Chris's book. So I recommend that heartily right at the beginning here. And, and the, the exploration that it's afforded us um, and the overlaps with my work with the Gene Keys. So, yeah. Yeah. real pleasure, real pleasure. Yeah. And we're, we're also, um, you know, it's an ongoing journey for us, isn't it? So we, we, we haven't finished. This is just us sort of getting going, I think. So I think we're probably going to explore this subject in the coming months and perhaps years and and keep diving deeper into it and yeah mining the insights that we that we can and also involving um a, a community of people to to engage with us with, like yes. this today yes yeah that's going to be fun i look forward to that if we can get into as much trouble as we got into with three hours just imagine what we could do with more time <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah. help it yeah. Uh, yeah yeah so um i mean we might as well just jump straight in we've Let's we've go. got a, a, a load of questions that have already been sent in so the plan here is we're going to um chris is and, and i've sort of sorted the questions that you've sent in uh into categories and we're going to kind of riff through them first because they they cover broad um a broad kind of area of subjects connected to reincarnation. And thank you, by the way, all those who send in your questions, they've really helped us to um, kind of sharpen and, 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 and some of those questions lead to more questions. And um, you should know that we don't know the answers to some of those questions as well. And, um, but we're going to explore them together. So, um, so we'll do that first and then we'll come round to the live Q and A questions um, that you can put in to the little Q and A button down here. If you at any point you have a question, you can drop it in there, um, and hopefully we'll be able to get to as many of those. So we have ninety minutes, um, uh, so a lot to, yeah. to, you know, a lot of time to explore. Well, you know, we broke up the questions. There were so many good questions, and we could spend hours and hours just on the questions that have already been sent in. There were so many good questions. We broke them up into clusters. And so we thought that let's go through some of the ones in the first cluster, just to read some of the questions so that the participants can get a sense of the types of questions that people were asked to move to ask after they listened to uh, our dialogue. So, and then we can just touch on a few of those and then move into the second cluster of questions. The first cluster we identified as how can we acquire personal knowledge of our former lives? Because it's, it's one thing, as many of you noted, to have someone tell you about these things. It's another thing to do your own research and to investigate these things. And then it's another thing still to have personal experience of your own former life history. So let me just hit a couple of these questions. And, and then one was, how can we get closer to completely trusting the universe and that reincarnation is true 
if all we have is book knowledge on the topic or stories from others? And another person wrote, is it possible to have a connection with your previous lifetimes in your present life? And another, can you give us a practical method that allows us to remember our past lives and see the lessons that are working, we are working on in our present life and what needs healing in our present life? Now just to touch lightly on these, just to start on these three questions maybe. And then one last one was, uh, have each of you personally experienced an awareness of your past lives leading to the present? And was it beneficial for you to do so? Okay. It strikes me that this whole question of, can we trust this material? How can I get closer to this material? How can I begin to experience these things for myself? It's a, it's a really important question. I personally started to accept reincarnation on the basis of research, on the basis of people's uh, research. And I think this research is abundant. There's a lot of wonderful books that it's just deserving uh, of our close attention. But it's another thing when you start to have personal experience of your own lives, when you do the work, when you go inside, either through con contemplation or hypnosis or some form of past life therapy, and you begin to follow your own memories back into your earlier memories and to begin to have this vivid experience that your consciousness is bigger than your body. It's older than your body. It has a longer history than your body. And that does tend to cause this, this idea to live in your heart differently than before. Don't you think, Richard? Absolutely. You know, one of my favorite questions in there was, um, once I know about the soul that gathers all my lives into one, what are some practices to help me embody it in my present human life? Yeah. You know, because we're talking about um, contacting the energy of the soul, you know, contacting the energy of, of the part of us that's eternal, you know, and that's like, that's a journey, you know, it's a journey we're all on. And most people listening to this are, are very certainly on. Um, otherwise you wouldn't be here I'm sure um, so yeah it's that's the first thing to, to, to contact these realms and to discover or come across um, wisdom that's that's buried somewhere inside you and and I firmly feel that this these memories are actually held in the physical body in the physicality of our body so right now begin with that begin with the, the knowing that or even the premise that inside your physical body, somewhere are memories held. And, um, and so this is going to involve some work with the physical body in some form, um, some relationship with the physical, um, with breathing, with awareness, with mindfulness, with, as you said, Chris, with contemplation and, um, you know, there are, there are lots of ways and there are lots of techniques and tricks and things that can help you. And, but rather than kind of give lots right now, um, I'd rather just give a very broad guidance, which is for me is if you're keen to know more about your own story beyond this lifetime, and that can be forwards or backwards, um, then start really listening and to, to really listen you need to clear space in your life so you need to have a practice i would say of listening or of contemplation or of meditation or perhaps of prayer or perhaps of you know anything that begins to enhance and increase that awareness of those other frequencies beyond the body and um and so finding the ones that really work well for you the techniques that really feel good to you and resonate with you is going to be a good indication that that's a good technique to begin to open up the inner world and then begin to create the space so that the, and, and you can put out the the question i'd like to know more that's it you know it's, it's already in you if you're if you're here it's probably already in you i'd like to know more i'd like to remember more and what you're doing is you're really reaching out into the ethers of the cosmos and 
you're inviting a revelation or a series of revelations. And, and that's going to be a journey as it has been for Chris and myself. And we've gone very different ways. You know, Chris is, and uh, Chris's route towards this has been very different from mine, you know, and, uh, and so you have to follow, begin with, begin with what feels right, what you resonate with. Um, and then the rest will begin to open up inside you. Mm -hmm. um, you, I mean, you've had more experience, I think, Chris, uh, with the um, past life therapy community than I have. So I, maybe that you could give a few pointers in that. Well, you know, when one of the questioners asked, do we have any practical suggestions for techniques that can help people and discover their former lives? And I don't want to go in that direction. I, this is, there, there are no shortcuts here. Uh, there is a matter of living with this information. And then also there is the systematic exploration of your deep consciousness, which is just a matter of following your, your memories to earlier and earlier stages. Um, and this is, can be done with contemplation, as Richard said, in various meditation exercises. But then I think it's also can be greatly aided by working with uh, professionals who can, who are, can help you stay conscious at deeper levels of your memory than you might ordinarily be conscious of. Because often when we go beneath our personal unconscious, we tend to get fuzzy and maybe fall asleep. But someone can help you keep focused as you go deeper and deeper. And it's often good to focus on a particular issue or problem or joy and follow that to its root as you go deeper within. Um, but there, there are many ways inside. Some people's memories are activated on a massage table. Some people's memories are meditated in medi uh, activated in meditation. But once you begin to appreciate that uh, your being is older than your body and live with that idea every day, it just becomes increasingly natural to live in a world that's saturated with time, to live in relationships that are saturated with time and, and with life projects. It, it makes less and less sense to try to compress everything that's going on inside us into one lifetime and more and more sense to let it unfold into a larger agenda. Yeah. So another good tip is don't be in a rush. <laughs> no, take your time, take your time. You have all the time you need to explore this amazing mystery. And the subject that we're opening up here is not just about reincarnation and rebirth. It's, it's, it opens up into, into all, all other questions, all the deep questions like, what are we, why are we here? How does it work? You know, all of those deep questions that we have inside us that we carry. Um, how can we be eternal? How can you know? How can that work? And then we're here. All those those things. And um, in the work I do with Gene Keys, as many of you will know, um, I have this infuriating habit of pointing people back into them their own wisdom, because if you can begin when you can begin to access the wisdom that lies inside you and it's and as i said start with your body with the physical um and begin to you know begin to kind of explore what's inside you and who you are and begin to m work through some of the issues and the shadows and the trauma that you hold and begin to forgive and begin to let go and surrender and go through this process of transformation of inner transformation, which is a whole journey in, in itself, as, as everyone here will know, then you start to open up space inside for your wisdom to appear and your memories to appear. And they will tell you exactly what you need when you need it, not before, not after, just exactly when you need it the wisdom will come, the memory will come if it's meant to come and it'll come in the way it's meant to come. So for some people are very visual. Some people are kinesthetic. Like you go to a place, you're like, I know I've been here before. 
or you meet a person and you and you look in their eye and you know you've met them before those kind of things or it could be um it's just a it's visual inside your cortex you know that you see it or there's so many different ways or it could be a smell or it could be through any of the senses um or just a, an attunement to synchronicities that are going on around you you know and uh, as we get more heightened and more aware of these other realms we begin to pick up on this interconnectivity um, that lies beyond this world, this this world that we are used to inhabit, inhabiting, you know, and we realize there are other dimensions and we begin to kind of resonate with those dimensions. And that's what we call wisdom. You know, when the when our when our world begins to open up and that clarity starts to come through from those other dimensions and it informs this dimension we're living in, in some expansive way, in some therapeutic, virtuous way inside us, in, in some, you know, in some process of opening. And that's, so that's really, you know, if you have these questions, um, whatever they are, know that, you know, the journey is always, you know, one of going deeper and deeper inside the question itself and sinking right down into the heart of it. And because it's, it's a very valid question if you hold it. Um, and it probably has another question hidden inside that and then another one inside that and they begin to open up and open up and open up. So I want to kind of say that as a, as a way of empowering everyone to, to trust in their own, in, in your own intuition and follow the threads, you know, through the labyrinth. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Shall we pull a couple of questions from the nuts and bolts section? Yes. <laughs> we have a section category nuts and bolts, which is basically how does reincarnation work? You know, some of them are long answers. Some of them are short answers. Here's a few that could be answered quickly. Uh, do we stay in one ancestry? Do we hop across to others? We hop. <laughs> You know, do we think our next reincarnation could be as our children or as our grandchildren? And there's research that says, yeah, could be, you know, people reincarnate in families. And another person asked, are animals part of the reincarnation cycle? And the answer to that, I think in all reincarnation cultures, they say, yeah, animals are part of the cycle but they tend to be at the earlier stages of one's reincarnational lives, because once you have gone through a certain level of cognitive development that you can function at a human level, there's not too much to be learned from going back and living lives as an animal. So they're part of our heritage, but not necessarily, we don't incarnate from a human to an animal, even though that's a very popular folk belief. It's not really, uh, a, it's not really a belief held by more informed thinkers of reincarnation. Do you want to pull a couple of questions from that list? Yeah, and, and actually I'd like to go back to the one about ancestry because um, I was recently talking to this um, wonderful man, Tyson Junker Porter, who's an Aboriginal um, indigenous uh, man. And he was talking to me about, um, in a kind of interview we did together, um, kind of informal one, <clears throat> we were talking about um, transmigration of souls and, and in <clears throat> many indigenous cultures, there are kind of, um, they track their incarnations and they have a, that there's a strong intuition held that within a tribal grouping or a family grouping or a clan that's close, that's close knit, that's operating like in those cultures, um, then there's a there's a real link between um one's own person and the great grandchildren or the great grandparents so it skips a couple of generations but they see um their great grandchildren as the as the next wave coming through and it, and there's all kinds of cross patterning within that um, and there's no kind of fixed way of understanding it, but it does seem to be a strong, firm tradition. So, and and recently, for myself, my father died recently, and I've been going through all of his ancestral things, and I found photographs of my great grandparents, as it happens, 
and um and i and i have an un this was before i knew i'd spoken to tyson and heard this i have an uncanny resonance to them that i can't explain mm. and i and it just came to me and i've and i intuitively just put their photographs on my desk and i and out of all the photographs that i looked at of ancestors and people like that those are the two that i really wanted to look at and so i put them on top of my desk and they've been sitting there looking at me for the last few months or month or so mm. um and so there's something in that i believe and um and I think it's interesting that yes, it follows. It does tend to follow through family lineages, but it also hops about. Um, and there may there may be a, a deeper storyline to that that um, we could go into at another time. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll hook another question out. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I kind of yeah, yeah. wanted to touch that one. Um, there was also one about wounding, which was from the past um, one, which I thought was important not to miss um about healing uh trauma in the body and i think it connects to some of the further later questions which are um about the nature of incarnation and and how we um you know what it really what it means to be in one of these and um the way i understand it through the work i do uh, is that you know, as as you so well put, Chris. You know, we're we're kind of moving on now from this up and out philosophy of like um, we have to get, you know, we have to attain this enlightened state, and then we're out and we're beyond samsara, and we're moving on to another plane. Um, and I speak more about being down and in. You know, that the more work we do internally inside ourselves to clear patterns, to transmute shadows to forgive and let go of trauma um, for the physical, emotional, mental body of our being, then the more space there is for us to incarnate more deeply. So it's like our soul is, is a vast thing. It's vast. It exists in another dimension. Most of it's not here. Most of us haven't incarnated, actually. <laughs> And, and so the more that work we do inside us, inside our being, and particularly I, I bring a deep focus to the belly, to the navel, which is where everything seems to cluster. And that, so that as you clear your being, then more light can, can actually come in and live here. And, and more, you know, you begin to radiate more. You begin, you, you, you begin to unlock more of that joy and more of that um, healing energy that's inside you, more of that trapped energy, because more of your soul can in, can come here. You know, it's a bit like, you know, that's how heaven comes to earth, through us doing this shadow work, and then more of us incarnates. So I wanted to say that because it felt like really important connection between trauma and incarnation. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let you take it from there. <laughs> well, let me toss a couple of these questions here. One of them, I thought, two of them stand out to me. One is, why do we forget our past lives in the first place? And a variation on that question is, if we are all eternal, immortal, and infinite, what is the point of reincarnation in a different physical body? Could we not all live eternity, different experiences, places, and people in one body? And uh, when I've been talking about this to my students, I ask them to imagine, imagine that you are the creative intelligence of the universe and you wanted to design a system to maximize uh, accelerated learning, accelerated development. And you had two scenarios. You could create a body that would live 100,000 years and then set them loose in the world to gather 100,000 years worth of experiences. And you could plan B would be to create a body that lived 100 years and every hundred years you pull it out and then you plug it into the system in a different body, a different gender, a different sex, a different you know, role in society. At the end of a hundred thousand years, which of those two systems do you think would produce the most evolved being? And I think we'd recognize quickly that it's the, the one that has discontinuity because discontinuity leads to greater variety greater variety leads to more accelerated learning. And so the reason we forget our former lives is precisely, I think, so that we can 
completely immerse ourselves in a new set of circumstances that are different. And it's the differences that make them challenging to us. And those differences basically accelerate our learning process. That said, there comes a time, I think, when the soul begins a process of not simply differentiating and gathering, differentiating and gathering, but a process of bringing in, bringing those lives together. And when we begin to assimilate the lives that we have led, what often occur, what manifest in our lives first, are the, pain, are the problems left over from these other incarnations, the tensions and stresses. But as we continue to work with those, we, we begin to tap into, I think, also the assets of those lives, the virtues and, and the capacities that those lives have. And see, I think much of our discussion of reincarnation is influenced by the past life literature. And the past life literature is a therapeutic literature where people come to therapy because they're, they're carrying a pain. But I think most of our past lives don't manifest as pain in our present life. Most of our past lives manifest as uh, capacities, as skills, as knowledge, as, as a capacity to do things and know things. Uh, so we have to be careful not to get our, our understanding tilted just towards the pain. That, that's a figural part, but it's also all the other things that are latent in those lives. So there comes a time when we begin to integrate those lives and begin to bring them together. And that's a sort of a different stage than earlier when we were going out and seeking new and different experiences. And I think we are coming at a time in history where the emphasis is on integrating our past, not simply pushing the boundaries of our past into new territory. Yeah, that's a great point, Chris. And I think, you know, is what we were talking about earlier, um, you know, that what's being processed on an internal level then is manifesting externally as well. By the way, be careful of your mic because sometimes it's scraping. Um, and um, <clears throat> so what we're seeing in the world is we're seeing the after effect of an inner transform transmutation that's taking place through the, through the group soul of humanity the group consciousness and um yeah that was i was looking at that question about um you know are there parallel universes to incarnate into and it made me think of um you know when you know when a soul evolves to that level of beginning to kind of you know beginning to transmute more of the karma of the of the world or of the you know of it of the suffering of the world there also is a more there's a seems to be a greater elasticity available to that being to that to that aspect of consciousness so there's a little bit more play and that means that there's more um ability to travel to kind of transmigrate between dimensions and to be able to kind of break some of the rules of the linearity of incarnating sequences you know because there's this like idea that there's time and we're moving with like we're stitching this beautiful cloth this fabric through coming in and out of lives like that mm -hmm. and i think that that i think probably <clears throat> there are many lives where we do do that but i think as we gain in wisdom and the soul evolution, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, then we begin to kind of reach a, a, a higher velocity or higher frequency where time is more, is more flexible for us. You know, so <clears throat> some of you asked like questions like about, do we have specific, do I have specific memories of past lives? And, and I kind of, I, I do in a way, um and i also don't because um there's a part of my mind stream that doesn't wish to cling to locations in the space-time continuum because there's a playfulness i find in the way that my mind operates it it reads the whole stream um or it reads a whole fractal or a whole pathway and a passage down a lineage and then it feels a resonance somewhere and then it follows another one and it feels a resonance there and they're forward and backward in time. 
you know, so they're not just historical, they're more mythic. Um, and so there's more of a, there's more of an interdimensional play, the more experience, let's say, um, a soul and a soul essence has gained. And I think that's kind of, um, that's where we can cross over into other dimensions and perhaps um, even travel with beings from other dimensions um, for periods of time. So, um, and have connection and connectivity and memory of beings in other dimensions or awareness of sometimes twins, even kind of like a twin energy in another dimension. Um, and, and that can appear to us in many different ways. And I, I've heard a lot of stories uh, down the years of people who have that kind of um, feeling, you know, that they carry, that they carry, that they're, they're not alone. There's something traveling with them. And, and whether they give that a name or not, um, it's something that's sort of, that they're participating in another kind of level of experiment. So I, th I, I think there are so many layers and intricacies within this woven tapestry of time space, you know, and, and what's clear is that in our talk, Chris, we decided, we started to explore this notion of deep time uh, where you begin to kind of step outside the space time dimension. And then, you know, a, 10,000 years on the earth can pass, you know, as a single stitch in time <clears throat> out of the form, that's an almost instantaneous. So we, we have that idea that, oh, I may not, you know, it's like <laughs> one of my last incarnations, I feel is quite a long time ago. And, um, and so that might seem like, oh, I, I've been waiting around in some other plane for a long time, but actually that was, that could, that time was instantaneous. You know, so it was just a bigger loop in the stitching rather than lots of little ones. It was like a bigger loop within the time continuum. Um, and then also there's this idea that you can then go the other way as well. You can go forwards and take leaps and loops forwards in the stitch, in the weaving of, of this journey that we're on. And you can begin to, the, the wider that your, your evolutionary lens becomes, the more collective it becomes, the more of the tapestry and the fabric of reality or of space time you can see. So it's like, you're no longer just doing a little stitchy, you know, pattern in the fabric that you've been making for you. You then suddenly see a whole section of the weave that's been created. And you suddenly see your place in that. Oh, I did that little stitch there, or I was part of that. And then, and then it's like you pan out and you're like, it's, it's vast beyond comprehension. Um, because there are so many beings and they're all one being and they're all weaving this incredible tapestry together. And it's within this, this vibrating, rippling fabric of space time. So there's a lot of play in here as well. And, uh, and I think it's important to, to kind of open one's heart to that, you know. Yeah, beautifully said, Richard. Beautifully, uh, I, you know, reincarnation answers certain questions, but in many ways, uh, it it really it's kind of changes the direction of the questions that we're asking. It just opens us up to a much more complex universe where we don't necessarily know the rules of where everything is going, where it's heading, but we can begin to explore it with a different set of hypotheses, a different set of assumptions. You know, there is one question that we put into this category I'd like to make sure that we that we get to, and that is the question about suicide, because it obviously comes from a, a very deep place. And one person asked, what happens with the soul of a person who commits suicide? Right. And uh, so if I'll, I'll just throw something in and then hand it to you. But in a reincarnating universe where nothing is eternal, everything is constantly changing and we're learning in incremental bits, uh, suicide is just one more episode of learning. It, it's not a mortal sin. It's not doesn't lead to eternal damnation. 
Um, there are many, many reasons why people may take their lives, and we may call them all suicide, but they're not all the same kind of suicides. They have very, very different motivational structures. But even if we're dealing with a suicide that comes as an act of desperation or an act of uh, almost cowardice, we might say, if it were that, even that kind of act it is greeted by the universe with understanding and with compassion. When we die and we begin to go through the life review and we debrief our life with the other levels of intelligence and beings of intelligence that surround us, I mean, let's face it, life inside time and space is hard. It's challenging and people get themselves in all sorts of boxes and dead ends where they, they get desperate. But even acts made in desperation do not have eternal consequences and we are not punished for such acts. We are, we are met and we have to learn from them. It's important, I mean, all of our actions can become habitual. So anger can become a habit, a character trait. Suicide can also become a habit that shows up in multiple incarnations. So it's important to confront the limits that led us to such a desperate act and find out how to bring that those limits to a different outcome, to bring our life into a different outcome. But it certainly, certainly I don't think suicide leads to anything like uh, a perpetual estrangement from the intelligence of the universe or the love of the universe. Your thoughts, Richard? Yeah, well, I was thinking how suicide is almost, um, it's always almost loneliness taken to its far, far extreme, isn't it? You know, where it's become so unbearable uh, that, that, that you, you've, you know, that that's the only option you feel there is. Um, and so that's a very human condition. <laughs> you know, it's, it, as you said, it's like, it's absolutely understandable that we feel at times deeply lonely. And sometimes the conditions that surround us are so difficult and challenging that, you know, one can empathize, empathize with that. And, um, and I think you're right. I think, you know, in, in one of the um, recordings I did recently that I shared with you was, um, and it's, I think we're going to put a link to it. It's the, the I called the rebirth sequence. And the and it's it's sort of these stages of moving from uh, dying and going through these bardo stages and but very simply laid out, and the final stage is called I call the arms of the mother, and it has various levels to it. But the arms of the mother is that that's what you land in, um, at when you've gone through those sequences, those that life review, and you you're coming into that place of self forgiveness. You know, because you are forgiven, but you have to forgive yourself. And that includes also not just, you know, that includes acts uh, of, of aggression and um, violence towards others. Or it could be things like murder, you know, and, and, you know, terrible things that take place on this earth plane. So the view from without, you know, outside the human, this human plane in, from the arms of the mother is not, as you said, it's not about revenge or retribution. It's simply about reconciliation and transmutation. And, and a lot of the time it's about forgiveness, self-forgiveness. You know, we, we have to, at some level, the soul has to learn from whatever it's done and then absorb and integrate that and forgive and move on and become stronger through it. And that's what this whole reincarnating pathway journey is offering us. So if you really tune in deeply, like you have, Chris, in your journeys into the, you know, into the, into the field of wounding and uh, in, in your book, as you describe, you realize that you have done, we've all done atrocious things, you know, in our history. We carry the memory of, of, terrible deeds that we were party to or part of or on the victim side of and and carry and at all kinds of levels all inside us i mean i i have a hunch 
that a lot of that memory is co is in the non-coding DNA in our body. You know, the, the so-called junk DNA that, that, that forms almost 90% of, of our DNA. That's, that's not, we can't understand, we can't see that it co what it codes for. Um, and so somewhere in, inside here are all those, those memories of, of places we've been, people we've been, things we've done. And isn't the, the most beautiful insight that arises from that, from an incarnating worldview, that we are always forgiven? You know, we, we love, we, you know, and knowing that, you know, that it, it opens up the, the journey of the higher soul, you know, because then the soul begins to f experience itself as light, as, as a Christ impulse or a Buddha impulse and it begins to kind of really become a beacon and wishes to help others and be of service and enter into that higher evolution and that seems to me to be the natural progression of the deep and you know that deep kind of encounter with the nature of what we call evil or, or you know or sin you know and and that is like or suffering you know that is the edge that that helps us become better people better beings you know more beautiful beings ultimately through self-forgiveness and forgiveness of others and um and it, but it takes a wide it, it's a big it's a big stretch for some people that i understand that it's a big stretch so yeah yeah the forgiveness of ourselves and forgiveness of others, but also restitution. There's nothing that we've done that we can't repair, that we can't make better because we have opportunity, we have time. We can change our past by changing our present and by moving forward. We can make restitution. We can help. We can bring healing where we brought injury before. Yeah. Maybe I'm very much aware that we have many questions that are stacking up in the Q&A, but I know that we wanted to touch briefly on uh, the coming shift because yeah. there were a couple of questions about the coming shift. Let me just mention a couple. One person wrote, I feel very worried about the changes ahead that you spoke about and wonder if you could offer a sense of hope to those of us who are struggling. And another person said, I think this shift that you are discussing can happen in as soon as 20 years. So very different kind of takes on this. And I think there is, um, uh, I think there is great grounds for hope. And it's not, not the hope that we can avoid the suffering that's coming at us and that we can change it, but uh, the hope based on trust and trust on the intelligence of the universe and that the intelligence that had brought us through the oxygen crisis billions of years ago and the intelligence that gave us the 50% increase in the size of our brain 200,000 years ago and the intelligence that we see bubbling up underneath us all over layer after layer in the natural world, that intelligence has brought the human race to this point in its story where it is basically forcing us to shed the limitations of living at a level of awareness of just our private egoic body-mind awareness. And the summons is to live out of a deeper soul awareness with a deeper set of our felt connection to other beings and to other species and to the planet as a whole and to life as a whole. I think there's tremendous grounds for hope, but the kind of hope that is not the hope in the avoidance of pain and suffering, but the type of hope that's born in the middle of pain and suffering out of a deep, deep conviction that there is a, a deeper intelligence expressing itself. We may not be able to see the full parameters of this intelligence, but we can, we can have the confidence that this intelligence is functioning here as it does function in other areas of life. Exactly. And, and that, that intelligence is essentially benevolent. You know, it, it is, it has, 
it has that it you know it's highest as i described just now it's like it through suffering it comes to know its higher nature you know and so as we experience that as individual souls so as more and more of us begin to come to that point inside our inside our our own soul's evolution then the whole of humanity begins to come towards that realization that we are actually one being here doing this you know and and so we see this externally through the through the way we our world now operates through the internet and through you know this this global connectivity that we now have and yet we also see all the shadows through that more clearly than we ever have and but we're also we have the capacity potentially to kind of heal the situation more than we ever have because we have this connectivity and humanity seems to kind of need to drive itself to the edge of a precipice sometimes it seems to be a pattern I, again talking to the indigenous people i've been talking to recently you know they say you know in their memory banks their racial memory banks are oh this has happened you know many many times <laughs> you know that we've come to crisis and uh, and and they're talking millions of years even you know their their memory banks go a long long way and um, so, you know, sometimes we have to come to these crux points in order for there to be enough of a kind of energy shift for us to push us, you know, to push us over and through. And uh, that's not a, not a pleasant situation. And, it, and as that energy builds more and more towards that, we will collectively feel more and more uneasy in our in our sort of body biome however in the soul awareness that you know as we as we expand into that more and more deeply and into that trust that field of trust that's underpinning the whole process and that's underlying creation that then begin that can then begin to inform our biology and and and, and it really does you know that i know that chris and myself we both feel deeply safe in this world even as the world begins to move closer and closer towards what looks like a kind of, you know, <laughs> Armageddon type scenario. But there's this underlying benevolence. And as you say, Chris, intelligence that is, that is preparing us for this quantum leap. And um, we have to kind of really sink into that trust field in the, the, uh, that is embedded in the eternal nature of our soul. Um, so this journey into kind of expanding our awareness of the incarnating universe and humanity is really, really important because it opens up, first of all, it opens up the mind to begin to like play again. Like, you know, this is like when we were teenagers, the teenage mind loves this realm, you know, and, and, and for many of us, when we went into our, our kind of twenties and thirties, then because of the way we were conditioned mentally, intellectually by the materialistic viewpoint, many of us, then these kind of conditioning uh, paradigms fall over us like, like a kind of heavy cloak. And so it's, it actually can be a great fun and a huge relief to kind of shed some of that stuff. And it doesn't mean we're shedding science and all its wonderful um, revelations. It just means we're opening up to a deeper kind of set of possibilities. And, and the mind then kind of can go, wow, anything really is possible. You know, we do live in a, in a you know, in a magical universe where, yeah, we, we can't understand everything yet, you know. And, but, you know, science is very slow in its kind of methodical processing. It, it moves at its own pace but the mind can really expand and, and, and open up to, to great vistas. And that, that's the first stage, I think, in, in beginning to kind of feel safe inside oneself again. So I, want, I really hope that that's a, a part of the journey that um, we can help build, Chris, here together mm -hmm. by continuing to map these other realms. Yeah, yes. Very much so. We're committed. We're committed. We're here. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things I talk about in terms of this coming era is the birth of the diamond soul in history. 
And I think actually the conversation that you and I are having here with all the people who are gathered with us is a small part of that process to become, because to become aware of reincarnation, to become intellectually and in your heart aware of this larger story that's playing itself out inside your life. When you become aware of something, you give permission for that thing to manifest more deeply into your life. So to become aware of reincarnation, to become aware of the soul and that the dynamics, actually, I think it facilitates the emergence of the diamond soul in your own awareness, in your own being. And I suspect this awareness can come in slowly for some people and in some circumstances, and it could come in dramatically and with sort of stunning effects in other circumstances, but it's, it's all coming in and to be conscious of something conscious even of the possibility actually facilitates this deeper integration uh, taking place. Shall we shift to some of the, uh, the questions coming in from our live audience? Yeah, before so many that we haven't touched on. But. No, before we do that, I want to just nail a couple of the Gene Keys questions. Oh, yes, yes. They're a bit more specific to me. Yeah. Um, you know, someone asked, and I have been asked this before, like uh, this, this, this notion that of walk-ins, of like a, a being that comes into um, a body and kind of supersedes it in some way. Um, and, uh, you know, some people say, look, if I've had an experience like that and I was completely changed after that experience. I was a new person and, and you know, should I study a different Gene Keys profile, you know, and from that date? And what I'd say is that um, it's important to have both um, because, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's like um, you need the old rootstock, you know, it's really important to have the rootstock. And then if there's a new kind of hybrid that's come in, those two have to harmonize together. So you can use both and you can explore both. And that's an added complexity for you, but it's also a rich journey to explore. So play with that as you wish, I would say. Um, and there's also a question about gene keys. Once gene keys, which are these algorithms that kind of determine our, our kind of awakening journey and our incarnation and its themes, um, you know, they do they, is there a continuity between them? Absolutely. I would say that there is a continuity between uh, sequences, but you don't have the same sequences. And well, you might through, through, you know, some kind of sleight of hand of the creator or whatever, but it's not this, you know, there, there's a, there are, there are patterns woven within the matrix and the numbers that if you were able to really look at different, lots of different life, lifetimes, you would begin to see these patterns and sequences, but they're not always like obvious and clear. I can, I can feel them. And as when I used to do <clears throat> um, human design, I mean, not human design, but when I used to do Jinkies readings for people and human design readings, um, I would see all these patterns um, between people and their families and their partners and their loved ones. And you get to see recurring numbers and sequences. So, <clears throat> you know, and it's really, really a lot. So you get to see, wow, this stuff that is so densely woven, these patterns in the fabric of these numbers, that um, it's showing me something that is not just kind of kept to one lifetime. It actually continues on. It's the th and there are these threads that, like I said earlier, that we're weaving. So, yes, there are continuities. Um, more on that at a later date, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, let's let's move to some of the live questions. So many good questions here. I'm just scanning through the list. Of so many wonderful questions. We're going to need more time, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one touches me here. It says. Why do you suppose that souls reincarnate for short periods of time, like the infant that dies just after birth or a young child that dies very young? These are great heartaches, of course, for any parent or, or anyone who experiences the death of a child. Uh, and I just suggest that things which look very large from inside the time-space perspective and from inside the egoic time-space perspective, from the soul perspective, don't look necessarily the same. That uh, it, it, feels, it feels tragic for us 
to have a short-lived life. But for the soul, they're all short-lived lives. A 10-minute life and a 100-year life are all relatively small bits of time against the vast spectrum of the soul's lifetime. And sometimes, you know, some of the past life therapists have engaged souls who have had this experience, and they, they all generally tend to agree that for the most part, they are chosen incarnations. They chose the incarnation knowing they were getting into. Sometimes the, uh, the lesson was for someone else. It was to seed, to be the, the grain of sand in the oyster that leads to a development uh, of other people. Sometimes it's but they are chosen. They are, uh, they are all part of an ongoing and unfolding process. Uh, and it doesn't mean, of course, with reincarnation, we really have true intellectual permission to really understand that our life does not begin at birth and it does not end at death. So we can let go of the heartache. I mean, there is separation in death and there is separating and there is pain when a, a life that we wanted to spend a lot of time with, we don't get to spend that time with. But life does not end at death, relationships do not end at death, and purpose is not extinguished in death. So. Yeah, beautifully answered. That's such a tender question as well. Um, mm -hmm. um, so Malabika has asked a question about um, uh, the soul outgrowing Gaia and moving on to other systems and um, and can the soul determine where it will go when and as what and, and uh, you know so there's this notion of how much um, free will does the soul have and are there other kind of forces at work this is a big deep deep question um, I kind of I think we touched on it um, a little bit in our sessions, but um, for me, it's that it's that kind of notion of these two forces of involution and evolution. <clears throat> and there's evolution where the soul. Let's talk about it as a soul evolution. So the soul is evolving through through its experiences, coming in and out of the form, <clears throat> and and it's getting broader and wider and more aware of its universal nature, right? And then there's also another force, involution, which is the arms of the mother. <clears throat> you know, the whole, the mother itself, the whole mothership, the whole collective consciousness, you know, the, the God consciousness, the divine consciousness that's doing all this through all these, these monads, these, the, you know, these fractals, these holographic children, you know, that are different, sort of crystalline aspects of itself but they are it then so the whole is also doing it so there is there's both a kind of choreography from the whole taking place and yet within that there's also this kind of serpentine freedom and flow as the as the crystals the individual crystal souls diamond souls let's call them become more and more aware that they are of what they really are, that they are the whole. And yet they also exist in the paradox of being a part of the whole. How can that both, the ocean and the drop, how can both of those take place? How can that occur? That's beyond the mind's capacity to understand in, you know, that's a paradox and, and a paradox of, of startling truth that can only be known as a kind of, as a, as a, through a bolt of, of revelation, I would say. So, both are true, you know, that we determine where we're going, the soul determines, but also the mother determines. The mothership has its own choreography and dance that we're a part of. And it's, it's an incredible dance playing with that uh, paradox. Um, that's all I can say is just to lay out the paradox before us so that we can consider it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Malabika. Oh, I think you're muted, Chris. Thank you. Yep. A question from Catherine says, Buddhists say that reincarnation is like transferring the light from one candle to another. What do you think of this interpretation? 
this way it can be transferred this way it can transfer both personal and collective karmic stuff i think you know when the buddha was asked a question about what is the self and the self that incarnates and we have many ways of thinking about reincarnation which are not very subtle and not very adequate and many people think of the reincarnation as a self migrating from life to life and when the buddha was asked this question he had a series of candles lined up and he had one lit and then he lit the second one blew out the first one lit the third one blew out the second one and passed the candle flame all the way down the line and so then the question is at the end is it the same candle flame or is it a different candle flame and the answer is well it's both but Buddhist wants to emphasize it's a different candle flame. And it's actually, if you get right down to it, it's a different candle flame from second to second. So the point and point here for the Buddhism is the teaching of no self. That, and no self is the teaching, not that we aren't individuals. That's an often, that's a misguided interpretation of it. It doesn't mean that there isn't an individuality here. What it means is, there is no permanent individuality and there is no separate individuality. So there is no permanent self, which never changes. And there is no separate self, which is cut off from the rest of existence. So that the individuality, which is, I think the essential, well, the center of our individual experience is open, it's porous. It takes in information and experiences and energy from beings, it gives out its own energy and it's not static, it's constantly changing over time. So I think if we were to take the Buddhist example of the candle, it would lead to a more subtle description of the categories of reincarnation. And that I think is the great value of the exercise is the subtlety of that description. Likewise, I think that feel theory is very is a very good set of categories and, and metaphors to talk about the soul, that, that the soul isn't an entity or a thing or a machine or a, a separate, you know, nut. If we think in souls of souls in terms of feels, Fields are by definition open. They're open at the boundaries. There's an easier give and take uh, between fields. And so, yeah, good question, Catherine. Beautiful answer, Chris. Really, yeah. that, was, that was really beautifully put. And um, really great to have your, your um, vast knowledge of, you know, different theologies in here as well brought to the fore. Um, some uh, Nishad has asked about the Bardo realms, which um, maybe both of us could say something on. Um, and she's suggesting, is it possible this life is in uh, Bardo? So for those of you who don't know the Tibetan Buddhist, um, I don't know if it's only Tibetans, I think. Is it only the Tibetans that, that name the Bardo, Chris? That's their vocabulary, I think, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So there's this notion of the Bardo is the, is the transitory um, threshold state between lives or it that's one way of understanding it um it's the stages as we move from one state to another state and there's a whole um description of different you know stages and states that they will describe as we move from birth to death and death to birth and um so there's a transformational process that goes on in that and there's also attachments to those different layers and layerings. So um, the way I kind of would understand it on a very broad level is that, because another way you could, the word Bardo has started to be used um, by Western people more um, perhaps is uh, as a, to, to refer to a kind of an impermanent realm, a changing realm, a transitionary realm or a transitionary world or sphere. And so in that, from that perspective, yes, it, it is possible that the earth is one of those bardos. Um, it is one of those experiences that the whole is exploring and it explores these theaters, let's call them theaters, you know? So it explores this theater and there's all these characters and storylines that come together in this theater and all these plays that take place 
and and the and the whole is the audience you know that's that's just watching the whole you know expansion of this process and and the whole or the audience is outside of space and time and yet all the bardos exist within space and time so they are the they are these journeys and theaters and productions you know from hell to heaven and all these you know because there's the heaven realms of the deities and all the bliss realms and then there's the and then there's the hell realms with all the suffering and then there's all the places in between and all of those are in one sense you could say that they are they are bardo's experiences um between states and and so yeah it's all a theater <laughs> as shakespeare said so anyway that's my 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 starting there but you might want to add some more mm -hmm. of your wisdom yeah, well no you say it well it's it is sobering i mean the teaching there are different aspects of the Bardo teaching and the word Bardo is used in different ways, but you know, it, one of the ways it's used is in terms of the levels of existence. Uh, as you say, from the lowest hell realm to the hungry ghost realm, animal realm, human, lower deities and higher deity realms that there are, these are exist in the cosmos. They exist in the spiritual world that lies outside of physical reality. And we enter into those various Bardo's, various levels of reality, depending upon the quality of our consciousness that we have accumulated over a course of many lifetimes. So, but then it gets much more intimate when the teacher says, all those bardos are taking place right now in the physical world, right here, right now. So there are deity realms. There are people who are born with a silver spoon in their mouth and they just seem to, everything always goes well with them. They're the captain of the football team or the, everything just kind of breaks their way. And there are other people who are living in hell realms and uh, everything is changing. Everything is turning over. Uh, and then we can get even more intense. It reminds me of a story. I don't know whether I can remember it completely, but there was a samurai who came to a Zen master and he wanted to understand the difference between heaven and hell. And the Zen master basically stood there and he began to insult the samurai and tell him that his clothes were dirty and his sword was dull and he really wasn't, wasn't worthy of the name of samurai. And the samurai, of course, had permission to kill anyone that they deemed deserving of death. And so he pulled out his sword and he held it over the, the Zen master about to cut off his head. And the Zen master said, that's hell. And then the samurai recognized the great compassion of the teacher who had put his life at risk in order to give him this lesson. And he immediately felt compassion and put away his sword. And the teacher said, that's heaven. So it's not just states that last for an entire lifetime. They're states that last minute by minute. We're constantly going in and out of different levels of reality minute by minute, then the invitation is, what is it that doesn't change? What is it that is inside us that witnesses everything and doesn't change as our emotions change, as our bodies change, as all these things change, what is it that doesn't change? When we discover that, and then we hold that in our awareness while we are living these changes, it changes the quality of the life that we're living. It just kind of deepens, it grounds us deeper into the, into the living quality of the deep texture of existence. It's to live in, in God awareness or in, in the divine awareness or in the, in the awareness of the living universe. Beautiful, and thank you for that great story. You know, it occurred to me that um, one of the great modern um, clear metaphors for the whole reincarnative story is is um groundhog day <laughs> you know <laughs> because it, that film is a wonderful funny film it's so wise it's it, it hits something very deep inside us you know and many people have had that same feeling like this is like this repeat of like trying things out in different ways and then trying to take advantage of it and then trying and then becoming hopeless with it. And then all the different dramas that get played out in one day, you know, 
and 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 that you could that's the metaphor for here this planet one light one world all those different dramas to play out until you come to create the perfect day you know like the absolute just your perfect day what's your perfect life you know and and um and then you're kind of like ah oh, that's that's what it is like you know and 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 you've brought it to the you've brought it to the zenith to the crescendo you've perfected your soul within it you know even though you had to go through some kind of terrible things you know and and um yeah so i i, I like that idea and i because i was you know i know there's lots of other questions but it just came to me as you were talking and um yeah what do you think about that it's, it's, a, it's a good one isn't it you're muted chris yeah, yeah. Oh, it is. A, am I on now? Yeah, it is. You know, here's a here's another good one. Maybe mention this one here. Sherry writes, "I have had many traumas in this lifetime. I'm tired of all the spiritual practices and processing. There are so many different ones. I have done so much spiritual work. This is why I love Gene Keys and Richard's way of teaching." I'm at a point of just desiring to be the love I know myself to be. And her question is, do you think it is necessary to do past life regression? I do not have the money to go to those who do this type of work. Or will we ever just be the love and know that that to be enough? And I, this has been the flavor of a few of the other questions we received and no, I don't think you have to go to past life therapy in order to engage one's karma conscientiously and to heal what needs healing and to deepen what we have an opportunity to deepen. What's important is to live one's life well. And if you live your life well, all the karma from your past that will, will come up in your life at some time and circumstance. And if you're living your life well, you're taking care of business as you go. Remember that reincarnation has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. And it goes on and it works very well, whether or not we know that reincarnation is happening, whether we know or believe or understand reincarnation and karma, it's still happening. It's still been going on. It was going on in the 15th century. It was going on a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago. What awareness of reincarnation adds, it adds an awareness. And with awareness, we accelerate the process. We can speed up the process. We can, we can stop avoiding things and start embracing more things. And as we embrace more things, we solve more issues. And as we solve more issues, we live a more relaxed life, a more open and challenging life. So no, I, I, my two cents is I don't think anyone needs to do past life therapy in order to live a very well and satisfying life. Live your life deeply. It's all, all your karma is right here around you at the time. Live it well, live it deeply. If you want some help getting around a particular issue or getting a particular boulder out of your life, well, that can be, it can be helpful if you can do it, but it's kind of a, it's an extra. Great, great. And a, and a lovely question as well, you know, really beautifully phrased like that. The being just is it's enough to just be. It is, of course, it's enough to be. That's a that's the most. That's the that's the most we can do, really. You know, so I'm I'm very much resonate with that question. Um, there's a question here about old and new souls and. Um, number of souls and you know and 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 kind of populations expanding and contracting and it's an interesting question and um you know if you think about it like most of the answers lie in nature you know and and if you're observant and you're listening and you're looking and you're really contemplating nature most of the answers are there you know i like you're walking through a a forest or a wood and you look in there and you see all these plants and trees and there are old trees and there are kind of middle-aged trees and then there are young kind of ones shooting up everywhere and then there are parasite trees and there are all kinds of you know there are weeds and there's you know they're all in there and they're all part of this ecosphere and the same here on this earth 
you know, on Gaia. We have, you know, enlightened beings, you know, we have beautiful beings, we have villains and ruffians and vagabonds, and we have all the different souls exploring and experimenting. We have young ones, young little saplings that are still learning that kind of, uh, you know, maybe get involved in all kinds of difficult things and suffer and deep in suffering and deep into corruption um, and, and, and learning, are learning through that, you know, and then there are older ones perhaps who've done all that and they're like here and they're like trying to kind of work more deeply into the collective or into some, you know, area where they've taken on a lot of suffering, to, you know, to, to heal it either inside themselves on behalf of the whole, or they're working in service in the service professions or whatever, where, you know, in service in some way. So there's all these different, you know, storylines and threads within the picture. And, and, and sometimes, you know, the forest dies back in places and it, and it's, it's less populous. And then there's sometimes when it suddenly expands and it's more, and there's, and it, and it does, it's thriving, but they're all phases then none of it's healthy or unhealthy. It's just what it is. It's just part of the, of the, the whole theater, the tapestry. So, you know, one of the things that the whole reincarnating view, the rebirth view really brings to me is this sense of, you know, amorality, you know, and that doesn't, doesn't take away, you know, true morals and ethics and you know which are naturally inherent in human beings i believe but there's this kind of it's just going on and there's a journey taking place and we're at some point in that journey right now the collective is in some point right now our individuality is at some point participating in that right now and as i i um I was really sharing deeply recently in the process. I'm taking a big retreat, thousands of people in the Venus sequence, which it's a process of healing trauma, um, emotional trauma, especially. And um, I was saying, you know, when you heal some pattern inside your own being, then you reach out and you heal it in the whole, in the collective, because it is all just one rippling web one interconnected woven web. I mean, I seem to be saying the same thing over and over, but I really want people to understand, you know, that, yes, it's kind of, this is, this is the theater, old souls, new souls, you know, and then there's old souls and maybe, yes, when you get to a certain stage, you have more choice available to you. You can leave, you can go somewhere else. You know, it's like you've earned it. You've, you've earned enough money to be able to buy a ticket somewhere else <laughs> further. And, and it's, you know, that's the kind of metaphor. So, but yeah, then you might also come back, you know, and bring your wisdom here. So I, I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of, you know, imagination that is needed when we're entering into this, into this kind of territory. Yes, very much so. You know, reincarnation, you have to live with it for a long time and then bring that, bring the questions that people are asking to, into that reincarnation paradigm and sit with it for a long time to get intimations of the depth, the way it recontextualizes and gives a new context for uh, the way we usually think about these things. And, Here's a question that really stretches us, uh, a question by Jacqueline. She, and this is a challenging question. How can collective suffering be a creative process rooted in cosmic love? How can creative, collective suffering be a creative process rooted in cosmic love? That's a hard question, just because the, the sheer scale. First, it, it works. It's a question that's hard for an individual life. How does suffering, you know, is how is suffering in our individual life compatible with the idea that the universe is compassionate and loving? But at a collective level, how does collective suffering 
of the type that we were talking about in our third dialogue, in our coming, you know, our coming challenging period of history, how can that mag magnitude of that suffering of that magnitude be a creative process rooted in cosmic love? And I'm reminded that Ramakrishna, the great Hindu saint said, if you want to understand God, you must be willing to look evil in the face because evil is not outside of the divine, but it's actually part of the divine process and suffering is part of the divine process. So if we want to understand how any compassionate person wants to reduce suffering and end suffering, that's the natural impetus. That's what we want. And we see suffering as the enemy and it's something we want to stop. But when we start to second guess creation, when we start to think there has to have been a better way to do it, God, you know, damn it. You know, couldn't you have given us everything that you want us to become without dragging us through so many centuries and millennia of pain and suffering or taking us more in the future? That's a wonderful impulse, but that assumes that we, we know what the project is, that we know what the agenda is, and that we know what is the best way to get to that particular outcome. So we would have to ask, what is the project? What is the, the project of cosmic love? What are we doing here? What is creation cr growing on this planet Earth? And could it grow a species of diamond beings? Could it grow a species of fully awakened beings and fully empowered beings and a species that can create out of the sheer power of the divine consciousness that lives, that is flowing in their awareness without having to have gone through some of the ordeals that we have gone through in our long evolutionary agenda? This is challenging. And I, and I, on the one hand, I want to affirm the compassion behind the question. And I want to invite a deep sitting with the scale of creation. We have to look at the galaxies and look at the stars to appreciate the scale that the universe thinks on and the scale of the creative intelligence thinks on. And look at all the stages of evolution that humanity and all life on this planet has gone through. Suffering seems to be part of it. It's just part of the grit of life that brings us forward. Now, I think we may be coming into a time when we won't have to grow through suffering so much as we have in the past that we, I think suffering has been part of the paradigm of how we have grown in the past. And it may be that we'll be able to grow out of grace more in the future, that we be challenged by creativity, not simply by our pain. But certainly suffering has been part of the stuff which has brought us where we are and I think where we're going. Uh, it, it suffering takes things away from us. It breaks us down. It doesn't allow us to continue the way we are. It forces us to reassess and to, and to look at things anew. And I think we're coming into a time where in order for something radically new to come into the human story, we have to let go of what we have been and letting go of what we have been is hard work and does involve a certain amount of suffering. But the sooner we cooperate with this process, the sooner we surrender to it, the sooner we let it go, and the sooner we start taking care of each other with that deep compassion, which is rooted in that cosmic love, the sooner the suffering ends and the creativity begins. I know that's not a completely adequate answer to the depth of this question, but it's, it's just a a piece. Mm. Thank you so much for that. I mean, I'll add a, a layer, um, which is in in the in the book I wrote, the Gene Keys book. I laid out um, the kind of, as I see it, the codes of consciousness available to humanity. 
you know, and, and so you see this through these shadows and these different, sh the, these low frequency shadow patterns that we all, you know, play out with playing in the suffering. And then hidden inside those are these potential gifts. And then at, even inside those gifts, so those gifts are the creative flowering, the healing, if you like, of the, the growing through that suffering. And then out of that comes this, this fruit, which is I call the cities, the 64 cities. Mm -hmm. And this is like um, probably where we want to bring our talk to a close with this, with this notion of um, there's something hidden deep in the, in the core of that suffering. And it is something so beyond what we can understand now. And it's something so beautiful and it's another realm. It's another dimension. It's another way, another field of learning, you know, and we might call it grace or we might call it bliss. And it's another whole, and, and well, you could even say we may be entering the epoch in which incarnation itself starts to fall apart and starts to open up and so that it, we no longer need to move in and out of these forms in the way we did. We may one day look back and go, oh yeah, we used to have to differentiate in that way um, because of the shadow and the impetus of the shadow inside us. But now we've explored that fully. We can sit in these cities. These cities are, the, are these, these higher states of consciousness, these avataric fields of oneness and we can still retain our soul's wisdom and individuality and its journeys and its continuation and its continued adventures, but from within a much greater field and of understanding and compassion, you know, and these cities are the, are, are, are kind of these buddhic fields um, that are opening up for us in the future. And I, I think it's, you know, Chris and I, we set this talk for Good Friday for good reason, in a way, it just fell there very beautifully because it's it's this notion of the constant rebirthing of the universe of itself from within itself, and um, uh, it's just it, it it you know I was saying recently that it's like if you take the the image of the butterfly, you know uh, of what a butterfly is, the myth of the butterfly, that the uh, the allegory, the the metaphor of the butterfly. It's, 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 do you need any more proof for incarnation, for reincarnation than that? You know, that, that, that right there is, is the emblem of what is hidden inside our suffering of what's hidden inside this, this thing here. And, and in this whole journey. So, so yes, I think we're moving into this next phase and it, it's good to be, realistic and it's also good to really expand and open up into that and let your heart really ring out with what's what the what the boundless potentials are inside you of, of your soul and and what happens if you really have worked those shadows through and then the full soul can come in the full soul can come in and that the body would hardly be able to hold it, to contain it, because the, 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 the incredible frequency of the quantum field that's generated from that, what we call those cities, those, and then, then we start to be co-creators with the creator, because then we're like, you know, our thoughts become uh, all empowering and we become these children of, of God or these children of Christ. Um, where we get to play in a much vaster field, that field that Chris was talking about, the, galac the galactic level, the, the universal level, we become universal consciousness and we, we can kind of interact with dimensions um, and paradigms that right now we can't even begin to fathom. So um, I think there's cause for great hope, more than hope, certainty really. Um, but we have a few boulders to clear first. So. <laughs> I'm what, glad you, I, I invite you to have the, the last word. Uh, well, I'm glad you brought in Easter because it is Good Friday and this is a special uh, weekend in the Christian calendar. And I know that you and I have both been touched by Christianity, by its teaching and by people who have been 
um, steeped in Christian teaching. Um, and we have been Christians and we have been Hindus at different lifetimes and we have been Muslims and we have been Aborigines. We, ha we have been all the religions of the world and the non-religions and atheists. We have, we have sampled and, 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 and drunk from those wells. We have been male and female. And in that constant collecting of experience and gathering experience and bringing that experience to higher, higher levels of fruition, when we encounter figures like Jesus or like Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, or like Muhammad, the prophet, when those beings are pictured in art, they're always pictured filled with light they have halos around them and, and light just emanates from their body and they have so much energy in them that they can heal beings with a touch. And, and Easter, of course, is, is death and rebirth, the, the indestructibility of life, death and rebirth continually going. And also, of course, the symbol of compassion because this is a being who did not have to suffer, but who chose to suffer out of his great love for the world. And every mother worth their salt, every father worth their salt understands that and would suffer for their children for this. Those qualities, those precious qualities, those are the qualities that we're developing. Those are the qualities that we're bringing in and empowering and empowering, as, as Richard said, the, the power of the soul, the energy of the soul is huge. And to be able to internalize the soul, we must make our body capable of functioning at that level, the way Christ was able to function at that level, the way the Buddha and the prophet were able to function at that level. So I think, that's, I think that's what we're coming to in history at a time when we who have been struggling in the shadows for so many generations are now beginning to come into a time of light, a time of, of great culmination, a time of greater freedom, greater compassion, greater wisdom. Uh, and where that will take us uh, will be a great adventure, uh, an adventure for us all. I really appreciate this conversation we've been having, Richard. I really appreciate everyone who's gathered around us and made this possible and made this adventure uh, possible. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Mm. A deep thank you to me or from, from me also, mm. and to me, <laughs> 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 to my soul, um, to all of you who've who've joined us and uh, who are joining us in in other timelines and um in other dimensions um and thank you so much chris and we will we are going to continue our journey chris and i together um and uh, we'll have more for you in the future i think uh so yeah see what that turns into good